I really hope you enjoyed the film. We're fortunate today to be joined by Susan Silver from the Northern California Resilience Network, Trey Vasquez from Movement Generation, journalist and film director Juan Carlos Davila, and Christine Nieves from Emerge Puerto Rico, uh, and who is the co-founder of Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, who you saw at the end of the film. Um, we're going to start with uh, just a few rounds of, of introductions so you can get to know all the panelists. But throughout this process, I would just like to encourage everyone to please add your questions for panelists in the chat. We'll be collecting all of those and, and asking them a little bit later on. Um, and if you have uh, any, any issues or anything like that, just feel free to just put those in the chat and we'll, we'll take care of them in the background. So I would just like to, um, to start with, with you, Trey, and, and ask if you can just uh, share with everyone uh, who's, who's watching a little bit about yourself and, and your work. Oh, uh, well, good afternoon. It's, it's afternoon here in the, on the uh, Pacific time piece, but for everybody on the East Coast, uh, good, good evening to you all. Uh, my name is Trey Vasquez. I'm speaking to you all from my home here in San Jose, California, uh, original home place of Pomo Peoples. And I'm here on behalf of the uh, Movement Generation Justice and Ecology Project. So a little bit about the crux of our work for uh, those who may not be familiar. We engage in uh, transformative power building towards liberation and restoration of land, labor, and culture. And for folks who've heard of MG before, you might probably associate us with just transition work. Uh, when you hear MG, which is rooted in, in building with social movements led by frontline communities uh, committed to a just transition away from extractive economies and towards regenerative uh, resilient, life-affirming local economies. And uh, I'm also going to speak a little bit um, this afternoon on the just recovery work that happened in the North Bay over the last two and a half years with my family and political home at the North Bay Organizing Project, of which uh, Andaki Fund was a part of. Thank you. Thanks, Trey. Uh, Susan, would you like to go next? Sure. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm Susan Silver calling from Berkeley, California. Great to be here with you all on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I'm the founder and director of the Northern California Resilience Network. And our, our mission is to catalyze a just transition to an equitable and regenerative region by supporting and activating community-based and ecological solutions in Northern California with a social and racial justice lens. So our evolving organization is really based on two programs. The first is our, our membership um, program, the Circle of Collaborators, of which Shareable is a member of. So it's creating that a decentralized network of solutionaries, of grassroots organizations and, co and conscious businesses, consultants who are really um, doing the on the ground work, turning despair into action through community-based and nature-inspired solutions. So, um, working with the coalition to share best practices and, and promote all the amazing work that's hap happening because really the solutions are here. We just need to scale up, scale them up. And the second um, pro program that we're working with is the Resilient Hubs Initiative, which is really similar to the mutual aid centers um, in Puerto Rico, um, looking at sites as demonstrations for resiliency through the pillars of community engagement, disaster preparedness, and permaculture nature or nature-based infrastructure. So really, um, how can we prepare these sites to be ready for anything um, that includes the coronavirus or earthquakes, et cetera. So bu building this network of sites and I'll speak a little bit more about them later on. Thanks, Susan. Uh, next, I'd like to bring in, oh, Juan, but it looks like we, we just lost him. Um, so we'll be, we'll be joined back with, with Juan Davila, the director of the film, uh, in, in a few moments. Um, but right now, we also have uh, Christine Nieves, who's just joined us. And Christine, uh, if you can unmute yourself, we'd just like to uh, have you introduce yourself, if you can, and, and a little bit of you know, where you are and a little bit about your work for a couple of minutes. Oh my god, that was perfect timing. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good evening. I, I am coming to you from Puerto Rico. You probably hear the pokey frogs in the background. And my name is Christine Nieves, and I was one of the co-founders of Proyecto de Apoyo Mutuo Mariana, which you learned about in the documentary uh, here in Umacao, where I am still today. And now I am co-founder and executive director of Emerge Puerto Rico, 
and it's a, an initiative that is focused on community-based climate change education and leadership development. So a uh, lot more to say, but I'm really excited to hear uh, from everyone and, and just thank you for the space. Thanks, Christine. And, uh, and now we've got Juan, who is the film's director and, and freelance journalist. Um, if you can just introduce yourself for a few minutes. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch what was the, the last thing. I'm glad to see uh, Christine Nieves here in the panel. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I basically have been uh, documenting uh, social movements in Puerto Rico ever since uh, 2010, starting with the university strike uh, of uh, 2010, and then went on to cover uh, social movements and uh, and other and other different uh, anti austerity uh, movements that were happening here in Puerto Rico. And eventually, uh, I, I started uh, documenting uh, all the movements that started uh, to develop around the debt issue in Puerto Rico in 2016. And from there on, you know, uh, many things have happened. The hurricane came. And one of the things, as is mentioned in the film, you know, is that uh, mutual aid centers uh, became a, a key role to, uh, you know, it became very important to attend uh, the issues in Puerto Rico. And, uh, and, and many of these has also a, a roots in, in social movements for many years ago. So, you know, it's nothing that, that came also from uh, just... A, out of nowhere, you know, this is something that, that has been built uh, up for years. And, and that has been my, my work as a journalist and a film, as a filmmaker, documenting the different social, the, the social movements in Puerto Rico in the last years and uh, shed light into colonialism in Puerto Rico, basically. Thanks, Juan. And, and just to give a little bit more context, we began uh, working on this podcast uh, about three or four years ago. And uh, when we started, started we knew that we, it, was, it was right around the time that, that Hurricane Maria um, hit, hit Puerto Rico. And we knew that we wanted to do a story, but we weren't sure what that story was going to be. And we were searching and searching and searching to find the right journalist to work with. And we're fortunate enough to, to come across Juan, who was already covering the story. And um, so much of, of what we were able to document in both the podcast and, and then the film really came from the, the on the ground work that, that Juan had already been doing. Um, and so it provided a lot of context and, and made it possible for us to do this. Um, so I would like to just move, move on and, and, and we're gonna do a series of, of kind of questions for each one of, of our panelists. Um, and, I, and Christine, I'd like to start with you um, because you were the last one we heard from in the film. Um, and I'm wondering if you can just kind of talk a little bit about, uh, a little bit more, because we, we, we heard a little bit, uh, you know, about, about how you were inspired to, to start um, the, the, the center in, in Mariana. And, and, um, but if you could talk a little bit more about that process, um, you know, about, about those, that, those initial, um, you know, days and weeks after, and, and then also kind of how it's transformed over time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, thank you. Well, it's, uh, I've had a lot of time to reflect and I've been diving into the, the experience actually, because I'm writing a book about it. Uh, the, the experience of launching Proyecto Apoyo Mutuo in my particular um, story or my particular uh, moment in time coincides with my wanting to return to Puerto Rico. Return to Puerto Rico when everyone was saying, debt crisis, all the young people need to leave, there's no jobs, there's no opportunities, and pretty much everyone, um, a lot of my family members had my nucleus, like my mom, my dad, my sister, my brother had left. And I, that, that was, you know, nine months before the hurricane, I decided, this is it. If I don't, I have, there's something calling me back, I don't know what it is. I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to go find out. And it took many, many years to get to that point where I was, I had that, that moment of saying, of, of sort of honoring that calling. And uh, I moved back to Puerto Rico, fell in love, fell in love with my now husband, father of my two, you know, my one daughter and my soon to be second daughter because I'm pregnant. So, and it was that, 
you know, I often say I left Puerto Rico because uh, out of fear, but I've moved back out of love. And it was through this process of, yes, the, the personal romantic love, but actually this deep process of decolonizing myself and falling in love again with the island beyond the narratives that we've been fed and that are constantly uh, magnified through the media that are very much about uh, doubting ourselves and doubting our capacity to come together and, and, and do unbelievable things and do things that, um, that we, you know, they're unbelievable because we don't tell ourselves stories about them being possible. So I, husband Luis grew up in Mariana. He knows this El Barrio. He knows everyone here. Um, he grew up volunteering in this uh, association. His dad actually it was a community organizer before him. So he kind of grew in, you know, he's, he's one of the few people, and, and I say, uh, you know, because we have a history of people uh, moving to the cities and moving, you know, to a better life. And his grandfather did something unusual. His grandfather said, I am not gonna go to the city. And he was very hard headed. And it wasn't necessarily that he was a visionary, but he was like, there's, you know, the land is important. Taking care of this land is important. Staying here is important. And it was that vision, you know, that, 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 uh, and, and that hard headedness and uh, that turned into his father then also valuing the land, deciding that he wanted to stay here, being part of a community uh, association that's been around for 40 years. So as Juan was saying, this is many generations in the making um, and we're building on top of that. And every generation before us moved us further into this moment. So we, you know, we happen to be living in and, and be so grateful and, and fortunate to uh, have access to this uh, infrastructure of this is just the association at ECMA here in Mariana that had a kitchen. So the hurricane happened, everything was destroyed. In our home, everything was destroyed. We looked around and there's this association that has a kitchen that is a professional kitchen for a festival that they've been doing for years and for decades. So it, there was this one important moment and I don't attribute it to any particular genius of, <laughs> but I think it was some sort of inspiration that comes from, who knows, it was this moment of saying, okay, we got to come together. And even though everything's destroyed and there's no food and there's no communication and it feels like it's impossible, we have to do this. And my, you know, Luis looked at me and said, we got to find a way to feed people because the FEMA is not coming. It's been two weeks. There's nothing happening. We could hear the helicopters flying by, but we were one of the first ones affected and no one was coming over. So then uh, he just started to do the first most important step, which is who do I know that knows how to cook? We got to talk to them. And that was the first thing. And it was so basic, but it started by feeding something really basic and primal which is food and it turned into feeding our loneliness feeling our sense of isolation feeding our um you know people coming together and being able to look around and say wait maybe we can do something about this so that's how it started and now it's sort of taken a a whole process which i would love to share but i i do want to want to stop here because I think um, it, it's, it's quite robust how we got here. And I, and I think it's important to share the, the, the root of so many generations before to get to this. Thank you. And, you know, and actually just kind of uh, something else that I wanted to, to hear from you, because I'm just going to stick with you for, for a moment and then we'll move on to the other panelists. I, I want to make sure we kind of get in. So I'll, I'll ask you a follow up question and that, you know, so your work started there, it's, it's kind of evolved over time. And I, I know that one of your focuses is really related, uh, your work is kind of focusing on, on mutual aid and, and its relation to climate change. And I'm wondering if you can kind of talk about how those things are intersecting for you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, you will hear my daughter come, uh, maybe crying in the background. So bear with me um, and thank you <laughs> for your grace. I, I will say, for me, it, the way it, those two are connected and, and, the, and it's becoming very vivid in the times we're living right now, is that mutual aid, to me, in the practice, I come to mutual aid from a place of having 
uh, seen how the current system that we live in doesn't, it's not designed to survive any kind of um, extreme event uh, or unexpected event that doesn't uh, somehow keep all the machines running. And so when I, when everything collapsed in Puerto Rico, I saw the Centro de Apoyo Mutuo in Caguas. I saw what Giovanni and the whole gang were doing in Caguas. And I was so impressed by the beauty and the, the sense of hope and um, how they were so, uh, it was such an excellent way to, to get people to move from despair and move from paralysis and move from, we're gonna wait for the government to come and save us into a place of what can I offer? What am I good at? What do I know how to do? And it just tra it transformed, it, it, it ju just transformed how we relate to each other uh, in a way that was beyond money, in a way that was about care. And, and, and now I see community care and how we relate to each other as what I call the invisible infrastructure. I see it as an essential part of what we need to be investing in. And depending on the context, we need to be looking at it differently. In Puerto Rico, um, it's, it's, more new, it's nuanced because it's not a new community. And many of these communities uh, where centers were um, sprouting, there's a lot of different generations of, of, of relationships. So you also have generational trauma. You also have generational feuds or, or beef between people. And when everything collapses, what, you know, how are you going to work with the person that you learn from your dad to hate or not talk to, right? Or, and so, and, and, and it, it is all part of a, it is part of a conversation that I think we're missing when it comes to climate change. And now that we're living in times of coronavirus, I think it's becoming you know, vibrant again, it's bringing us to, you know, to focus. Uh, how are we going to navigate all this? Just uh, last week, I saw a headline about the ocean temperatures were record, rec you know, record breaking heat. Um, and that means that we're going to have a very, very active hurricane season. So we it's it, it just brings us to to this moment of recognizing that it is the it, that invisible infrastructure of these centers and the, the the and not only the centers but our capacity to be able to work through through healing through forgiveness rituals through and and you know how do we deal with people that we may not want to be working with in the context of Puerto Rico, which might be different in another community, and include that as part of the conversation of mutual aid. So I think that that's, um, to me, what climate change uh, is forcing us to, to think about as, as humans is, is really around, uh, around the emotional part, around our emotional intelligence, around um, yes change and and but also around the the part of through honoring and recognizing that we have a lot of things to heal and work through that that's actually an opportunity to wake up and decolonize our, ourselves um, not just politically but decolonize ourselves in the biggest sense which to me is around our relationship to mother earth to our environment um, so that's that's how i see those interconnecting and constantly in conversation with each other. Thank you. I, um, I really like that framing that you put, the community care as invisible infrastructure. And, oh, excuse me from a plane going over. And, uh, you know, so we, we often think about physical infrastructure um, and, you know, the, the mutual aid centers really were this incredible future, you know, this physical infrastructure that, that was a necessary hub that was created. Um, but we also need, there's also layers of social infrastructure and, and those are often invisible, but can really be the key determinant in how we get through crises. You know, those social webs are, are oftentimes the determinant factors about whether or not people survive or, or, or don't. Um, you know, people are looking after each other. And, and, and so that's, 
you know, something that's going to be, you know, becoming very clear, especially now, you know, as we are in this moment of, of the pandemic, um, you know, when it's, it's, we actually can't go and be in our, in our physical centers and, and connect. Um, and coming out of this, um, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be something that people really, that we're already starting to see the effects of, um, you know, the, the impact, um, you know, we talk about it in the, in the, in the film, but the, um, you know, the, just the, the, the impact on the, on the, on, on the collective psyche, um, you know, that, that collective trauma, um, which, which came in after Hurricane Maria is we're really starting to feel now uh, as people are losing their jobs and their livelihoods, um, people are losing family members and there's a lot of fear that's going on. Um, and so that social infrastructure will not only be necessary, you know, meeting, you know, climate change, which, which it will, um, but also in, in this present moment as well. Um, so thank you for, for sharing all of that. Um, I'd like to go uh, next to Juan and, and, and just to stay here in, in, in Puerto Rico. Um, and I'm wondering if you can provide a little bit more um, context for just the situation as things stand now. Um, you know, we, we, coming after Hurricane Maria, there was uh, just, a, uh, just, you know, less than a year ago, there was, you know, these, this historic uh, political uprising um, which took place, which, which led to the resignation of, of the governor of Puerto Rico. Um, and now, you know, the, that organizing has continued. Um, and as, um, you know, there's been this, this wave of, 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 of people coming together and, and meeting the needs that the state really isn't meeting um, around protection, for protection and testing and, and, and care uh, during, during the pandemic. I know that there's, in, in Puerto Rico, there's, there's also um, a, a dearth of, of resources and, and support from the federal government. Um, so I'm wondering if you can kind of just talk a little bit more about the, the context of organizing in general in Puerto Rico and, uh, and specifically about what's happening right now. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Tom. Uh, I think, I mean, I'm going to start referring to what we, you talked last, is that uh, one of the problems that all of this has generated is that we are starting to, uh, people sometimes are starting to normalize the absence of the government. And, uh, and in this sense, you know, uh, you, you see it not, not, with the, not uh, throughout the people who are in the mutual aid centers, but, but for example, let's say, uh, let's say that sometimes uh, when the earthquakes uh, came into Puerto Rico in, 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 in the early, uh, in early this year, you see a lot of uh, people saying, ah, oh, the government is not going to do anything. And then the celebrities and the Puerto Rican artists reacted. And then people are starting to normalize the idea that philanthropy and that artists are going to take care. So, and, and, and this is very dangerous because the, 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 the government needs to be held responsible. And I think uh, the, obviously that's one of the challenges that uh, all this project of mutual aid and, and self-management and, and what is in Spanish autogestion, which I don't, I, I haven't ever, ever been able to find a perfect English word for that. But this sense of self-management, you know, uh, really, uh, we uh, we need to work so it doesn't be co-opted in the way that you know that the self-management means that uh, that people outside of the government would, would need to take uh, care of this and 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 I know Giovanni talks uh, talks about this and I, I just want want to say this because I, I, I it's 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 something that uh, that the that that the government uh, constantly is putting out there is something that. Uh, you know that that people you hear them in the streets saying, "Oh, so uh, the tarps after the earthquakes that were given to the people were donated by Coca-Cola." You know, so so that's wrong. You know, you know, for us not problematizing how the private industry is also taking the role of the government and how dangerous that is, right? And how maybe a, a, a projects like the mutual aid projects and the mutual aid centers, uh, the the message will also be co-opted. So I think there there's there's uh, going, going starting from, from where you ended. Uh, just to give a quick over, overview of, of how, how things are standing now in Puerto Rico, uh, you know, we, we, like you said, I mean, this is a, this is a, a film we did in, in, in 2018. We filmed it in 2018, two years after is where we, we're still uh, releasing it and now premiering on TV. It's always like a weird deja vu when, uh, <laughs> when you see a project about it, it, two, two years after you shot it, right? Like, 
you know, you need to like land again, you, you know, to, to get familiarized. But, uh, and maybe even Christine forgot about the interview until they <laughs> called her for this. Um, but I, I think, you know, one of the things that have happened, you know, is that uh, in, in, in the last summer, after Hurricane Maria, uh, two years after Hurricane Maria, uh, there was a, a, a and, and this is widely known, but I'm just going to uh, summarize uh, to, to review what has been happening. Uh, the governor of Puerto Rico, uh, the former governor of Puerto Rico, Ricardo Rosselló, was involved in a chat candle where he actually, uh, you know, like the documentary shows, uh, uh, you know, exchange a, very uh, insulting language with its uh, most close ace. This was leaked and people uh, got very uh, mad uh, about this. And this uh, event, this, led, this was uh, the catalyst point that led uh, thousands, uh, million, uh, one million of, uh, of Puerto Ricans in the streets in one day protesting against the government resignation. But like I've always said, this is an accumulation of things and this is the accumulation of of, of the debt crisis, the accumulation of the, of the lack of response after Hurricane Maria and Hurricane Irma, and obviously uh, the lack of, uh, of, of response and the colonial policies and neoliberal policies that have been uh, pushing our country for years. Then after the Ricardo Rosselló, uh, we had the, a series of earthquakes in Puerto Rico at the beginning of, of the year. And, uh, and I think what, what, what is interesting is that, uh, you know, many of these networks that were built uh, during the, uh, of mutual aid uh, after Maria were actually put uh, into work again. You know, you would see uh, people from uh, Comedores Sociales uh, uh, going uh, to deliver aid to the South. So those networks uh, uh, remains in place. And I think this is one of the most uh, amazing things about uh, the mutual aid center is a network that he has created all throughout the, all throughout the island, and uh, so, 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 uh, so, yeah. So the so so then we we saw a, a response of the people not waiting on the government. But it goes back to what I was saying at the beginning that this is in some way dangerous. That is something that that we need to to be careful about, right? Like I was saying that the Coca Cola giving a, a, a tarp for the people. Uh, this is very problematic when they are so responsible of 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 extracting so many resources in, in communities all around the world. And then we come into COVID-19, which uh, probably our, our pandemic was declared the same time as in the US in, er, in March. And, uh, and now what we are seeing here is that there's not enough uh, testing that has been given to the people. Puerto Rico also has a big, big issue that is not usually being, uh, you know, people don't speak much about it, but is that people, uh, in Puerto Rico, the government doesn't have autonomy to deal with uh, and, and take and, and negotiate tests from with other countries and uh, and even get a, a nego and, and coordinate help with the uh, World Health Organization, but rather it depends totally on the U.S. market to supply the test. And you know how everything has been in the U.S. and the mess that is right now in the U.S. with the test. Imagine here in the colony, right? So this is clearly uh, becoming a, a bigger problem, right? You know, it's, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, the, always the, the issues intensify in the colony. And if you, and, and in, the, in the sense, you know, in the U.S., I know there's the case of not enough testing, even in New York, and people have been de being denied testing, even when they uh, have the symptoms. The same thing is happening here. But I suppose that here, you know, it's more dramatic because of the lack of autonomy that the Puerto Rican government has. Um, and then, uh, and then today, uh, coming uh, all the way to today, today there was a protest actually in San Juan where they went to uh, the Department of, of Health uh, uh, activists, many, uh, many of the activists who also come from the mutual aid. Uh, so that's why I'm, Giovanni was there. So that's why I'm saying this network continues. And they were actually uh, uh, demanding that the a government uh, supplies more testing because also there, there's a huge scandal here about how much the the tests in Puerto Rico cost to the government versus what actually they are providing. So there's also a local corruption scheme within the colonial uh, problem. And the other thing that they are uh, telling, you know, is uh, and and they're calling out is the is the 
is the business owners and and the and, and the and the business people and the and the private corporations because they are asking for, for for the measures that Puerto Rico maybe is more strict than most states in the U.S. right now uh, in regards of social distancing, but that those uh, but that that opens and uh, and may and and this would represent a, a bigger problem and uh, and since we don't have a clear idea because people are not being tested uh, how much is really uh, the 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 number of sick people with COVID nineteen here uh, this creates obviously a, a bigger problem and uh, so what we're waiting so so those are the main calls that were happening today you know more testing and that. Uh, and calling out to the private corporations that they don't uh, push the government to open business and which in fact uh, will affect mostly the working class people. Thank you for that update and especially for about what's going on today. Um, and you know, just, I've got a, just one, one follow-up question. You, know, you, you brought up earlier about, you know, there's a, a question about the, the tests in, in coming to Puerto Rico, potentially being more expensive, you know, charging the, the, the Puerto Rican government uh, more than, than is being charged for, for other states. And, and because of the colonial um, uh, relationship between, between Puerto Rico and, and the United States, um, a lot of people may not know, but goods have to go through the continental United States before they come to Puerto Rico, oftentimes adding exercise tax and all sorts of other things. So I'm wondering, you know, during this, this point, and I know this, this, this kind of came up uh, after Hurricane Maria and, and came up during the political uprising last year, I'm wondering if there are kind of more conversations happening um, on, on a kind of a mainstream level, um, just questioning this relationship and um, reevaluating whether or not it would, it would make more sense for Puerto Rico uh, to become a state or to be its own independent country. Uh, I mean, I really, uh, what I would say, maybe Christine, you can also uh, talk about this, uh, is that, you know, these conversations are, are, are not happening wide in, in the country. I think the U.S. have been very effective. Uh, the U.S. have been very effective in always uh, criminalizing the Puerto Ricans for their own uh, issues. You know, some of remembers me, are, make me think about the the book Facundo, you know, and and, and how you know uh, here in Latin America we are barbarians and we don't know how to govern ourselves. So I think you know, uh, obviously we have a, a very bad set of politicians in Puerto Rico, uh, but I think you know that actually the, the U.S. is using that to their advantage to put out a narrative that actually is the uh, is the is the corrupt politicians in Puerto Rico. And I think for many years, people have always directed their, 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 what they, their, their responsibility of what is happening to the country, to the local politicians. And I think, you know, there's, uh, and of course they are very much responsible, but there's a bigger uh, aspect of that, which is US colonialism. And obviously these politicians play in favor of US colonialism, but uh, I think the conversation stay, stays very local and and, and many times, uh, and I'm saying in the wider sense, the public debate in the country, as, as you were asking, Tom, uh, do not necessarily uh, go into, uh, into the public debate, this type of things, and, and people are not necessarily connecting it to the relationship of, of, of the U.S. And I think this is important for activists to constantly uh, bring forward, you know, that, you know, we have a government that is very corrupt, we have a local elite that that negotiates the well-being of Puerto Ricans so they can get a piece of the cake. But on top of that, we have U.S. colonialism, which obviously allows and, and pushes for, for all of this to happen so they can maintain power and control over Puerto Rico. Thank you, Juan. And just real quick before we move on, I don't know if, uh, Christine, if there was anything you wanted to specifically add for that. I think Juan covered it. I would only add that I, the more we start finding the information about just like learning the real history that because there's no if you try to find history about the relationship between Puerto Rico and the US, 
you will not find a lot of stories. So the more you start looking for the stories that are not being published in mainstream or you know, history books, which history books, which language, English or Spanish, who's, who's writing it? You start identifying traits that to me resemble more of a, um, a relationship that you, you know, sort of an abusive relationship traits, if you think about it and metaphorically between um, individuals where there is a lot of manipulation, there is a lot of abuse happening. And if you had a friend who has been convinced that she or he is not good enough to be on her own because, and she, you know, is better off or he's better off with this other person that's clearly met, you know, emotionally abusing this person, you would definitely recommend your friend to break up. And I think, you know, to me, it's very interesting how when we talk about politics, we forget that really we're talking about relationships of humans as well uh, within themselves and each other. Um, so that's, that's the only thing I would add there. Yeah, thank you. And with that, I would, I'd like to, to move, um, we're gonna leave, leave Puerto Rico for, for a moment. And, um, and I would like to, to go and, and invite Trey to, to come in. And, and um, you know, in addition to uh, working with Movement Generation, Trey was, was involved in the launching of the Andaki Fund in Northern California after the Tubbs fire in 2017, um, which took place right around the exact same time that Hurricane Maria hit, hit Puerto Rico. And while we, uh, you know, the film is very much focused on Puerto Rico, it, it really is uh, just one example of the many communities that are being affected by climate fuel disasters around the world. Um, and especially uh, these disasters are um, uh, affecting marginalized, po you know, populations that are already marginalized. Um, you know, those that, that are uh, migratory, that have undocumented statuses, um, those that are um, in historically unresourced communities. Um, and the uh, undocumented community in Northern California um, was no exception uh, after that fire. Um, so Trey, I'm wondering if you can start just by just talking a little bit about the, the response that you were involved with um, to help meet the, the needs of that community um, coming and just kind of what, what happened with that initiative. Thank you. Uh, Tom, just want to appreciate y'all for putting this all together and just send some love out there to the camarada relatives over there in Puerto Rico and all your organizing work. It's beautiful to watch the film. Um, I wanted to name just seeing it like touch my heart uh, to see the acupuncture clinics that were happening because I, we were holding our own clinicas here too. And I think that simultaneously some similar things were happening at the same time. So it was very beautiful to watch. Um, you know, first, I want to start out by just saying that uh, when we talk about these climate disruptions, it's really hard to, to isolate them, right? Uh, we re recognize that it's not one or two or even 10 disruptions. It's a, it's a line of disruptions that have been happening for, for many years. And for a lot of us, our communities, it's uh, built on a legacy of over 500 years old of colonization. Um, and so when these things happen, it amplifies the injustices that already exist within our communities. Uh, and we know colonization has made it, uh, disrupted our capacity to be permanently organized in the ways that, um, in the ways we were and in the ways that many of our communities still are able to be. Uh, so I do want to set the context there and that goes for this COVID moment as well. We're seeing it um, especially exaggerated. Uh, but, uh, you know, as far as the, the wildfires go here, the first one that started in 2017, uh, I always say this when talking about it, there's no way to be prepared for something like this. We knew it was coming. We know we're in, we were in an especially dry season. We had the most rainiest winter and the driest summer. So that set the perfect conditions by the time fire season came that everything just went up at a rapid rate and scale. Uh, when we got hit, uh, notifications did not go out in any other language uh, besides English in terms of evacuation. So folks, a lot of uh, particularly monolingual Spanish speaking folks, but folks who spoke many other languages in the county had no idea what was going on or didn't know if their neighborhood or area was to be evacuated or where they could go or any of that. Uh, and uh, NBLP has been put in a lot of work since then uh, to be practicing language justice and holding the county uh, accountable to make sure that these messages are sent out in a variety of languages and all of their recommendations are taken into consideration in response to these uh, climate disasters. Um, 
in terms of what it looked like on the ground during and in, in the aftermath, uh, you know, the evacuation centers were also not a safe place or an inclusive place. And in fact, were oftentimes more harmful folks were experiencing uh, discrimination in the centers, uh, front lines, community folks experiencing racism. And on top of that, a lot of people feared going to the actual centers uh, for fear of ICE and other uh, military presence that was there, like the National Guard, which just isn't safe for a lot of people who are coming from Black, Indigenous, people of color communities. Um, so that's just to give a little bit of what the, the terrain felt like here. Um, but I would say, you know, we knew right away, uh, many of us ourselves coming from frontline communities, that we were going to have to be the ones to respond. Because if we were going to wait for them to come help us, save us, they weren't coming. Uh, and so part of that effort uh, on DocuFund, which was uh, mentioned, MBOP played a role in the development of that with two other organizations, the Great Day Labor Center and uh, North Bay Jobs with Justice in developing that fund in 2017 um, as, a, as a form of mutual aid. And uh, additionally, the clinics that I mentioned earlier uh, called Sanación del Pueblo, which were providing health treatments for people who had limited access uh, and have had limited access prior to the fires, uh, which included mental health care, holistic health care, and traditional cultural health care as well. Um, and when I say uh, MBOP, I'm referring to uh, North Bay Organizing Project, just to clarify there. Um, and I also just saw the common threads, you know, with folks uh, in Puerto Rico talking about food and joy as that center of, of, of um, resilience, uh, as a center of culture and well-being. It's a, the heart of cultural organizing was important. Um, the Undocu Fund, just to give folks uh, an idea, in 2017 to 2019 has uh, already redistributed almost $8 million to uh, 4,500 people in the county. So for folks who don't know, uh, uh, undocumented people are not eligible for FEMA assistance, despite being impacted uh, the hardest in many cases by fires. Uh, so people had no way of restabilizing. Uh, and, you know, like, not only that, people were back out working. We live in a county where one in 10 jobs are based in tourism, hospitality. Uh, so folks who are working in the any assistance and people were out working in the fields within days of the fires igniting and fires were still happening and being exposed to more particulate matter in the air uh, as on top of pesticides that people are already exposed to doing agricultural work. So Indocufund played a huge role uh, in providing mutual aid to communities. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to uplift uh, in terms of general mutual aid and things I've heard folks mention here is just what a powerful opportunity it is uh, for people to practice self-governance, to be in the practice of self-governance. Um, and I completely hear um, the concern around these things being co-opted by, gov by government, right? And then all of a sudden we become entirely responsible uh, for the stabilization or restabilization of our community when the policies in place are directly contradictory to that and our struggles are a result of uh, unjust policies and legacies of injustice. Um, and so, you know, that gets more into this conversation about just recovery as a pathway to a just transition. Uh, but I think I want to stop right there just in terms of really uplifting the mutual aid efforts that happened here during and aftermath of the fires and that are continuing now in the COVID moment that we're in. And just uh, for folks that are interested, um, we made a, 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 another uh, audio documentary about UndocuFund and the response to the Tubbs fire uh, in 2017. And so you can find that on the response podcast and you can go deeper. And, and also the UndocuFund has, you know, it's, you mentioned it's, it's been something that was launched by three different organizations. One of the things that really struck me was just how many people supported and got behind it, you know, recognized that there was people in their community um, that were being left out of that official aid um, within the, the first couple of months of UndocuFund launching, there was $6 million raised to uh, support the community. And UndocuFund has been able to, um, you know, to support communities when needed, um, shut down and then reopen you know, after other fires. And, and, and again, it's, it's open right now as, as a way for, for folks to, to contribute and support people in, in the North Bay. Um, so 
you know, before, before we leave and, uh, um, Trey and, and move on to Susan, um, I, I would actually just like if you could just say a, a, a few more words about, um, you know, really what, what, what you meant by when you say a, a just transition. Um, you know, what, what that actually kind of is, you know, what the kind of about the just transition framework a little bit and just kind of what that word means. Because I think a lot of people hear it, but don't necessarily know uh, what people are talking about. Right, sure, I can uh, speak to it to the best of my ability, how it lives in, in my community. Um, and I think that it lives in every community differently. So I wanna uplift that and acknowledge that as well. Um, but I think, you know, central to that is really looking at the way that it, the economy is structured here and that it's built up, again, as mentioned earlier, um, from many folks it's built upon a legacy of colonization, exploitation of labor of black indigenous people of color um, and, and destruction of the earth, right? Now that we're seeing really come to a head in the moment that we're in. And so a lot of the work in the Just Transition uh, framework which could be its own whole conversation and, and workshop, uh, but is in transitioning away from that extractive means of, of having economies and moving towards uh, being in right relationship to the places that we live in, uh, creating regenerative means of functioning within our community. Um, and that's, that's more of an overview, uh, but I want to also name, you know, like the way that it lived here as it applies to talking about just recovery was that we're really considering and wanting to stay true to the political nature of mutual aid as a means to stabilize our folks, but that we're also creating the political shifts that need to happen so that we can restore our communities, right, and, and look into what could be as opposed to uh, just going back to business as usual. And, um, you know, we kind of, we frame it as like, not just fighting the bad, but also creating the new or a new old way of being in right relationship to the earth and to each other. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's, uh, you know, you talked about also just that, that the local focus and, and really how, you know, what, what a tra just transition means can, can mean very different things depending on the context that you find yourself in. And I think that's actually a really great segue to, to Susan. Um, and, and Susan's work with the Northern California Resilience Network, um, because so much of it really is a, a, about the development of, of, of place and, and kind of um, going deeper about what resilience looks like um, from, from a, a place-based framework. Um, so Susan, I'm wondering if you can uh, in, uh, go talk a little bit about the, the, the resilience, uh, the Northern California Resilience Network but really dive into the, the resilience hubs, because I think that's you know, the, the, the thing that has the greatest overlap with what we saw with the mutual aid centers in, in, in Puerto Rico, um, is that the, the hubs that have been being developed uh, in, throughout Northern California um, really are the types of things that, that people can do where they are. Right. Yeah, great. Just um, again, wanna honor the, the incredible work of of the other of the other panelists thank you so much for what you are for what you are doing and yeah so again the, the northern california resilience network is really acknowledging that there is such an abundance of incredible solutions that are out there um, in northern california so just um, creating this network um, this platform of groups and organizations and businesses that are rooted in community, rooted in nature-based solutions. So finding platforms for, to connect and collaborate with each other. We know that so many of these efforts are very grassroots and working in silos. So we're trying to work from the back end and, and help support these efforts, help to lift us all up so that we can create a just transition, that vibrant movement that we all know and want. And in terms of resilient hubs, it's really, yeah, it's super similar to the mutual aid centers that were um, that we saw in in this movie, and looking at them as permanent. Um, what are the sites that could be the permanent mutual aid centers um, starting in Northern California, and recognizing that there are resilient hubs all over the world. So I, I um, began thinking about resilient hubs when I noticed all the incredible work the site-based work that was happening in Northern California, the permaculture centers, the community gardens, the, the community um, centers, and started thinking about what if we merge this 
Um, disaster preparedness, you know, we have to really prepare for earthquakes out here. Disaster preparedness with community engagement, equity and inclusion with sustainability and permaculture. So we started developing this program um, to really reach out to these sites and ask what, what are the projects that you're working on and what is, that, is it that you need? And started, um, we began getting funding from a couple of sources and have redistributed about $10,000 in grants to about 20 sites around Northern California. And we really want the, the, the work to be rooted in that community for them to say like, this is the project that we wanna work on, which is you know, really, really essential. Um, and part of what we're doing, part of the work that's happening right now with COVID is around food because there's such, there's such a huge need as we know for food security and all the food systems are breaking down. So the, um, some of the gardens in these um, sites, for example, are expanding their efforts to um, not only grow for themselves, but for community members. And then we're also connecting with other groups in our network that are then distributing the food to unhoused populations, to, to vulnerable communities. So providing them with the fresh produce so that they can then um, feed these you know, vulnerable populations. So you know, cre that's really the essence is creating these very hyper-local um, food networks, um, as well as these sites that can be really um, ready for anything. And one thing I wanna mention is yes, we see lots and lots of incredible mutual aid efforts happening right now. And it, it is an incredible opportunity to, to um, think about how can these be permanent? How can we um, have mutual aid all the time? And also, how can we have jobs as community organizers for these mutual aid efforts? Because most of these folks doing mutual aid are volunteer. And this is the work that is, this is the important work that's happening, is the community organizing. So in terms of, for example, the Green New Deal, let's make sure that we include community organizing, that we include resilient hubs as part of the Green New Deal so that we can, we have jobs, these important jobs as community organizers, and we have funding and resources for this important work. Um, and I'm really excited to report that we're um, a new partner with a national group called the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and they work directly with, with local governmental agencies to help create resilient hubs. And so we'll be working with them as the community-based organization partner and working with the local governments to create resilient hubs, not just really big multi-million dollar ones, but, but resilient hubs, and there should be resilient hubs in every neighborhood. So that is really our intention to, to help support the, the sort of the smaller um, hubs, also you know, the, the bigger hubs that in case of an earthquake, we can, uh, they can be distribution sites as well as sites where people can go and, and stay. Thanks, Susan. And you know, I'm wondering kind of for, for those that are, that are listening and watching that are feeling inspired and wanting to um, create those hubs, like you're saying, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and we should have one in every neighborhood. Yeah. Are there, are there specific resources or anything else like that that you can point people towards to help with that process? Yeah, we, um, well, we did partner with Shareable to provide, to um, support a, a resource around creating a resilient hub and we're working on something um, more specific to really map out how exactly to create um, a, re a, a resilient hub in your neighborhood or or your community center, your place of worship. So yes, we are developing those online resources, but I, I also feel like um, these mutual aid groups are a really beautiful, great start. And we, I, I hear all the time these neighborhoods, for example, that are getting together and, and building community, even though you can't, they can't see each other, they're building community you know, as, much as, as much as they can. Um, so yeah, we'll be providing online resources as well as um, in other, Northern California, we'll be putting a call out for um, any site that would like to become an, a resilient hub um, with our network. And yeah, the intention is that we have um, a network of resilient hubs all over the world. And I think this could be a really beautiful way to bridge the urban rural divide where we have, for example, sister hubs in an urban area and a rural area that really connect and collaborate 
with each other and get to know each other across community. Thanks, Susan. And now, you know, throughout this process, we've been getting a number of, of questions from folks in the, in the chat. And I just want to make sure we've, I've tried to ask some of them as we go and some have been, have been addressed already. So if I don't give you credit for the question, it's just because you are, you are right on par with your question and, and the, the panelists can already address them. Um, so, you know, one of the, the questions I have, and this just goes back to, to Puerto Rico, you know, there's, a, there's uh, you know, folks that are on the outside that are looking and saying, you know, wanting to contribute. And so one, one question is, you know, is there a good pathway um, for people to come from off island um, to come to come off, off you know, come offer their support and how and how and what is the best way for them to show up. Um, and so I'm wondering, maybe if, if Christine, if you can um, you know, touch on that just for just for a moment. Sure, I always. You know, the first thing that came up um, was how incredible both the outpour of support was after the hurricane, but also how much labor there was around the education process of educating people that didn't know about the history of Puerto Rico and with very good intentions, just were wanted to learn and wanted to learn about it, but then we became both the organizers and the teachers and then there was emotional labor involved um, because a, a lot of it triggered certain emotional reactions because of lack of knowing what I refer to as a history that's not written in books, right? And so um, there's assumptions that are made because that history is not there. And if, if you don't know, then you don't know that there's trauma and you don't know which trauma triggers your pushing. So I think the first thing that I would um, say is that know that we live with trauma because precisely because it's not easy for any for everyone to just find out the real stories and the real history <laughs> about Puerto Rico. It's not that easy. Um, it takes there is a Puerto Rico syllabus that you can find and it's online. I think it's it's PuertoRicoSyllabus.com or .org. And it is a very comprehensive reading list. And that's the first thing I would say, take your time to read about us. Uh, but the, th the second thing is that as a result of the hurricane, there's been an emergence of networks and organizations that are focused precisely on either educational programs and being the halfway point, the people that are, that you, you, that are basically linking to community groups and then you as a person who wants to help you, you are paying someone who then becomes an employed, you know, as Susan was talking about community organizers needing to be employed. This is one way of generating income for community organizers. It's a little tricky how to do it. But I would also give a shout out to Maria Fund, mariafund.org. Maria Fund has done an extraordinary job at being, staying true to the real the realness of what's happening on the ground in Puerto Rico while also grappling with extending um, a bridge for people that want to come help from outside. And they're very real about saying, okay, you're asking too much or mm, your assumptions are not right or mm, you want to try to help, but that's actually hurting. So that's sort of the role they've taken, um, an extraordinary group of women. And I'm sure there's a lot, and, and I've heard of a lot of different efforts um, and at the top of mind, but I just wanted to share very vulnerably how um, we both now have lifelong friends from people that that just came over and were like, like how to help and the ones that were both most humble, most willing to listen, most willing to allow their what they thought we needed to collapse, right? Their, their own thoughts of what we needed to collapse, they were the ones that are still in our lives. Uh, the other ones, not so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. And, and I think that those, I mean, how you, your, your example of how, how people, how you, you know, suggestion of how people, you know, should and, or, and can show up, you know, for, for Puerto Rico is, is, is really uh, a great model for how to show up for any community. Uh, you know, like there, there often is this big rush to help, um, you know, either in our, in, you know, right where we are or when there's a, you know, a, a disaster, you know, somewhere else. And, you know, without having that kind of deeper context for the community you're coming into and really that humbleness 
that that showing up to be to be in service as you are needed to serve not necessarily as you have a preconceived notion of how of how you are going to contribute you know or what you're going to contribute or what you're going to do and and it it does take take a certain amount of humility um you know when you show up to to be able to pause and listen and assess and and allow to to be directed by by the people that are there that are on the ground that are most impacted um so so thank you very much for for that and and you know we've we would we've kind of um answered a number of our of the questions that have come through i mean there was there really was um you know just one more question again this is about uh, about puerto rico that i don't think we've we've addressed quite yet um and this one comes from from chloe uh chloe richards um, who was asking about, um, you know, how, how, and this, this could be for, for you, Christ, Christine, and also for, for Juan, um, you know, how you feel that, that these grassroots movements across the kind of the entire island speak to the lack of, of an urban and rural divide, um, which I guess is seen more in the, in the globalized and urbanized world, um, which I guess is, uh, and I'm actually not familiar with this concept, but it's uh, Neil Brenner's theory. I don't know if anyone, if either of you feel called to jump in. So let me see if I understand the question. The question is around how the fact that the that mutual aid centers have popped up both in urban and rural areas, it's sort of, it's actually challenging. What, what's the, what's the, I think it's actually the concept? More, I think it's more looking at the, the that, uh, and, and this is something that I don't have a lot of context for. So again, I'm just trying to pull from the question. Um, and so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll move on if, it's, if, it, and if I can't actually structure it right. But I think the question is, is really getting at the fact that how close the urban and rural is in, in Puerto Rico um, compared to many other areas. And I think it's touching on, you know, asking about, you know, is, is, is that successful or more successful um, you know, the, the, the organizing, do you feel like that is more successful about breaking down the, the urban and rural barriers that often exist in other communities um, because of, of that connection? You know, that's a very interesting way of, of, of it's a hypothesis. I mean, it, yeah. and, and I've, huh. So it is a bit about geography, but my, my intuition um, is, tells me that what I would, the way I would consider this is less about the, or maybe that's a factor, the proximity, the physical proximity, and more about how, you know, my dad always says Puerto Rico un campo. Puerto Rico is, is, is really, el barrio is really the mountain. And I think there's something about how that culture, you leave, you, you leave the rural area, but it's always with you. You're going to see the chickens in the, in, in the city. You're going to see, like, people are planting their banana trees in, in gated communities. I mean, it's just, so, so to me, what, I, what, I, what's, what I'm really, what's really coming up for me is that, um, and it's, it, it's almost, I think it, it's an act of resistance, whether we like it or not, but it's, it is showing up our ways of relating to the land, showing up in the urban areas. And perhaps, yeah, part of that is because we're an island. So we can, you know, we, we, we're not that far removed from El Campo, but anyone in the city will tell you they can't wait for the weekend to go to El Campo. Um, and uh, now that's actually one of the things that I hear the most from our city friends. They, they're like, oh, they can't get out of the city and they want to. It's the land is calling them. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for answering that one and, and, and for bearing, bearing with as we navigated that question. And, uh, and you know, thanks. I just want to thank all the panelists for joining us um, and just uh, give one last, last uh, opportunity. If there's any, anybody that's presented that would just like to um, just share any last resource or other event or something else like that, that uh, for people to be able to follow up with you. I mean, I think what, what Christine said about the organizations, uh, I think it's very important to make sure uh, for people who want to help from outside uh, to, to really know what, what organization you're working with. Uh, and I think one of, the, one of the ones, particularly since, since Hurricane Maria, has been the Maria Fund. And, uh, and the Maria Fund has been uh, not as extended after Hurricane Maria, and they were very key. 
in uh, in in giving a, a funds to grassroots activists after the earthquakes in in the, in January. So I think you know organizations like that. I, uh, also, I would mention Casa Pueblo in Adjuntas is another organization uh, that uh, that people need to be, really be be aware of, uh, of of really where do they put their money and and, and that it be a grassroots uh, uh, organizations and and, and, and foundations that are connected to the grassroots uh, movements and I'm pretty sure uh, myself and. and I don't want to speak for Christine, but I'm sure that you know many of us activists. If you, if you want to reach out and and want to need need anything to point you to the right organization, uh, we can help out on that. Uh, but I think that's very important because a lot of uh, a lot of uh, money, for example, has has come in. in for example, after Hurricane Maria, uh, for uh, one organization I think was Unidos from Puerto Rico, uh, United for uh, for Puerto Rico, that really you know. Uh, it's very questionable how, how they work with the money. So, you know, not necessarily follow the first ad that tells you, oh, you want to help Puerto Rico, you know, here's how you can donate, but, you know, look deeper. And, and that actually makes a, a huge difference. So I, I really want to encourage that. And I know it's also the same in, in, in the U.S. And I'll, I'll just, I agree completely with one. I would say um, one, one thing to really consider is um, ask whatever organization you're going to give money to, ask them to tell you the names of people that they're working with on the ground. Where are those people based? Uh, which towns? And you'll see, you start seeing the people that are mostly in the metro area that um, have the nicest websites, the sharpest newsletters, um, generally don't have very strong roots in outside of the metro area, which translates to their level of impact. And I think that that's something that the Maria Fund, this, you know, despite most of them being in the metro area, they've done an incredible job at um, getting out of that comfort zone. And I think that's an important thing to, to consider. You know, are they San Juan based or not? Um, because it speaks to privilege, it speaks to, con you know, colonization, it speaks to a lot of things. Um, and I, I do want to put a little plug for Emerge Puerto Rico, which is a, a, the organization that we're launching. And we were supposed to launch it now in, in April, COVID, you know, birthing, all these things. Uh, it's delayed, but it's, uh, but Emerge Puerto Rico for anyone who's interested in climate change curriculum, and I want to connect with Susan later on, um, that's what we're doing. We believe that the, the type of human traits that were shining through in our mutual aid groups across the island can actually be turned into curriculum, whether it's popular within the schools or outside of the schools, real stories that kids start consuming from very early so that we can you know get the programming out of all the the capitalist programming that we have um to actually open up to the the, the different restorative ways of relating to each other so oh christine nieves.net and sign up for emerge puerto rico for the newsletter that's what i meant to say <laughs> thanks everyone <laughs> great and susan would you like to uh, just share any last resources or any anything that's coming up? Um, sure, yeah, just um, I'm at Susan at narcoresilience.org. If you want to reach out to me, um, just want to put a, put a plug out to all the amazing, you know, food justice projects that are in this area from, you know, the Gill Track, the Permaculture Action Network, the Sororite Land Trust is an incredible, um, um, project run by indigenous women in, in Oakland. Um, so yeah, find your local projects, support the grassroots. And I, um, yeah, and shout out to Tom and Sherbel for all the incredible work that you're doing. And may we all find this moment as an opportunity and, um, to build resilience in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our communities. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Susan. And, and Trey? Yeah, just so much appreciation and gratitude to each of you for representing uh, the work that you're doing in your communities, your familias, your home places. I'm um, just really grateful to be here. Uh, I want to uplift for folks that are interested in learning more about uh, Just Transition. The, the website was named in the chat, but www.movementgeneration.org. I also want to say, as was mentioned, uh, similarly to people who are experiencing climate disasters uh, reoccurring, we're looking at the potential for uh, cascading 
uh, crisis and the fact that we're approaching wildfire season and still in being sheltered in place. And so all of the potential really uh, scary situation that that could pose for people needing to be evacuated, but uh, being at risk, higher risk because of that. And uh, we are currently also um, building with the Reclaim Our Power Utility Justice campaign in the Bay Area, which is organizing a body to hold PG&E responsible, who took, you know, they, they took responsibility for the lives lost, uh, 84 lives lost in the campfire. Uh, and so we're building to hold them accountable and also build a community owned energy system that invests in local systems. So want to uh, encourage folks to check that out too. reclaim our power utility justice campaign as we talk about building new ways to be. Thank you. Thanks, Trey. And, and just to uh, just continue on that, that thread real quick. Um, so the, the response podcast, and, and again, we talked about this film coming out. Initially, we, we developed the response podcast and you can find it on all of your, you know, wherever you listen to your podcasts and, and at the response podcast.org. Um, but we're going to be launching our, our third season of the podcast next week. And the, the first episode is actually going to be with, with one of Trey's colleagues, uh, uh, Michelle uh, Mascarenas, who I'll be uh, interviewing. Uh, it, it's going to be an interview with, an extended interview with her, uh, focused on something that you mentioned earlier when you, when you were doing your, your first introduction, but the idea of permanently organized communities. And so we'll be, we'll be diving deep into that. Um, and with, with that, um, you know, again, we're just, we're kind of closing out here. Um, I just want to let, let folks know that, um, you know, uh, we're so grateful, you know, and, give, and extend gratitude to our partners at Free Speech TV um, that were co-hosting this event. Um, this, this week, they've got a, a whole lot of other content um, related to Earth Week. So please tune into Free Speech TV all week uh, for, for more Earth Week content. And you can, uh, even if you don't have a television, you can access it at freespeechtv.org. Um, and uh, for anybody that uh, that you know that you you know if you feel compelled to share uh, and encourage other people to watch this film, this film will be running on Free Speech TV uh, nine more times in the next t in the next two weeks. Um, you can find a full schedule um, on our website at charitable.net about when the screenings will be, and as well as on Free Speech TV. And you know, and we we kind of we talked a little bit about how um, you know these these disasters are. I, it just was said right at the end about how these, these disasters are, are starting to build up on top of each other. Um, we're already seeing this with the tornadoes in the Southern United States this, this last week. Um, similarly with, with a recent earthquake that happened and, and we've been at Shareable, we've been trying to cover, um, you know, from an editorial perspective, um, this kind of this community led response to all these disasters kind of within this, this larger context. So I would also invite people to just go to shareable.net and look at our extended series. Um, and we've published about 14 articles to date and we're gonna, we're gonna be continuing to, to publish pretty heavily about it in the, in the coming weeks. Um, and if you wanna kind of, uh, in addition to that series, uh, we also earlier this year published our, our first book um, related to the response. And so there's a free book that you can download um, and you know, it, we encourage people to do that and please share that resource as well. And and with that, you know, just again, final gratitude and, and appreciation to everybody that, that joined us, to our panelists, and uh, to all those that, that joined us, you know, on Zoom on, and on, on Facebook. Um, thank you for helping us celebrate this monumental occasion of launching this film out into the world, you know, into not only to, to people that are in our direct community um, that we tend to get to talk to, but to a much larger community through our partners at Free Speech TV. Um, so, so thank you all and have a, uh, a wonderful evening and a, and a great Earth Day. Thanks everybody. Good evening. <laughs>